uh, Ed Friedman, Chair of Friends of Maravini Bay, thank you all for coming, and thanks for bringing all the great food. It was really nice. And uh, for those of you that came too late or didn't bring food, sorry you missed it. Tough luck. You know, I'm there's sorry. still food out there. I think there's just a little bit left over, right? So, so our speaker tonight um, by day, um, Rob Burgess, um, mild-mannered part of the senior management team at Bangor uh, Savings Bank, but at night he's an avid stargazer. And uh, he became interested as a kid uh, in that, uh, watching our first manned space flights, manned space missions. Um, although he's trained as an attorney, his passion is astronomy. And he shares it as a NASA solar system ambassador. Whatever that is, we will find <laughs> out, I, I hope, I'm sure. And as a president of the Southern Maine Astronomers. Um, he lives in Brunswick here, and he has public star parties in his Brunswick backyard observatory and has hosted thousands of school kids back there and community groups in doing guided tours of the night sky. Longtime member of the International Dark Sky Association, I encourage you all to get on the web and look that up. A lot of great resources with them. And uh, uh, Rob slightly been channeling his interest in the um, sort of regulatory and civic arena through the Brunswick uh, Planning Board and been advocating for better control of outdoor lighting and commercial lighting and increased awareness of deleterious effects from poor lighting. And um, so this is um, October, November, January, no, October, November, December, January, fourth event of this season's speaker series. Um, we've been doing this for over 20 years and I'll just call your attention to the next uh, event which will be back in our regular venue at the Curtis Memorial Library in Brunswick and we will be talking about a really incredible series of maps or maps made by George Sproul, Sproul in around 1770 of the Midcoast area and uh, our speaker will be Matt Edney who is a professor in history of cartography at USM and again that should be really interesting so <clears throat> these events are October through May the second Wednesday of each month. Rob, thank you for coming. Let's give a hand to Rob. And, and he's going to pick the winners afterwards, so hope you get, you know, hope you them something good. <laughs> That's right. You know, bid early and often, as they say. Um, well, thank you very much, Ed. Um, I just wanted to start with a small uh, bit of poetry. Um, and it's from uh, Longfellow. Silently, one by one, in the infinite meadows of heaven, blossomed the lovely stars, the forget-me-nots of the angels. Wadsworth put that into Evangeline, A Tale of Acadie, uh, many years ago. And I think that's what we're talking about tonight is what is out there in our evening skies. Um, I'm honored to be your guest speaker this January night on the, the occasion of your annual meeting, and I'd like to congratulate you on your success. Could, could I just get you to drop that microphone down? It's like bisecting your face. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully it won't be too loud. Yeah, no, your, your voice is fine. Thank you. But just hearing what uh, Ed recant recounted as to the activities of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, it's, it's very impressive. You've got a wonderful website that's very instructive and helpful. And frankly, we might steal some ideas from your website because we think it's so good. Um, but as my uh, quote from Longfellow intimated, uh, my talk to you tonight, Let There Be Dark, addresses a problem not quite as obvious as many that we face in society, but one which, through the scattering of wasted photons, can have a profound impact on so many of the things of value to us. I am, of course, talking about the deleterious effects of light pollution. In a world full of problems, this is not the biggest. But as I hope to convey to you tonight, this is a serious one. Uh, one whose impact is only just beginning to be understood and which could be profound. But unlike so many of the larger societal problems we face, this one can be addressed at the local level where we live and is one where each of us 
can have a positive impact on the natural world around us. Oh, I think this, uh, now we're into technical difficulties only because it sat idle for so long. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Um, the organization I represent, Southern Maine Astronomers, is celebrating its 15th anniversary. Um, we're a group of amateur and professional astronomers who love astronomy and enjoy sharing that interest with others. We provide outreach to the public, including school kids, through star parties and talks. And I, I will just qualify that not thousands of people in, have been in my backyard, but over the last 25 years in various locations around the state, I've uh, been part of a uh, host uh, hosting organization for, for kids and visitors. Um, but of late we've modified our mission statement to emphasize and educate about the risks of losing our night sky to light pollution, a problem that is hard to reverse once its effects are felt. We meet monthly at the Southworth Planetarium on the USM campus in Portland where we discuss what's up each month, uh, offer technical help with equipment, and have a speakers program addressing interesting new developments in astronomy. All of our meetings are free and open to the public. I'm also a NASA Solar System Ambassador, um, a volunteer program of about 750 people nationwide who help educate the public about current and planned NASA exploration missions. Um, my remarks do not represent the opinion of NASA nor of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena that is the sponsor for the program. So what is light pollution? And um, why is it yet another problem that we have to concern ourselves with? Well, light pollution is misdirected or misused light, generally resulting from an inappropriate application of exterior lighting products such as street lights, billboards, and commercial building lighting. Its effects are many. Negative impacts on a variety of environments and ecosystems, including human health. Sky glow, uh, the glow over cities and towns impairing our view of the night sky. Glare, the potentially dangerous interference with people's sight while walking or driving. Light trespass, unwanted light shining onto an abutter's property or into their home. Uh, higher taxes and prices, inflating the cost of municipal and business operating budgets through more electricity use. And global warming. Inasmuch as electricity is still produced in fossil fuel burning power plants, wasting electricity increases noxio noxious emissions from those plants that contribute to global warming. So let's spend a few minutes on these. The impacts on the environment and ecosystems. Um, it's my perception that our societal awareness of light pollution is much like our awareness of air and water pollution was in the 1960s, in the pre-clean air and clean water acts of those days. We allowed our air and waterways to be used as public sewers for disposing of all manner of toxic effluents, innocently not thinking or callously not caring that there were downstream consequences. The term tragedy of the commons was revived, describing when a public resource is overused and destroyed because individual users, acting in their own self-interest, deplete or despoil that resource due to their collective action. And I think the same is true of light pollution today. In fact, we regard light as generally a good and harmless thing, so it's overuse it's straying into fields and woods and into the sky is no big deal, right? It's odorless, colorless, tasteless. So how could it be of harm? Well, consider these effects. It's estimated that 60% of animal life is nocturnal. And this makes sense since we live in a world where it is half light, uh, light half the time and dark the other half. Animal life has evolved over millions of years around this characteristic of our planet. Artificial light has existed for a mere fraction of that time for about 140 years, too soon for any meaningful adaptation to have occurred. Light pollution upsets the balance of predators and prey. <coughs> um, 
Nocturnal animals sleep during the day and do most of their hunting and food gathering at night. Light pollution changes their cycle and transforms the dark of the night into a different, confusing, and more dangerous environment, particularly for prey. Many animals depend upon uh, nighttime for their reproductive cycles. For instance, frogs and toads croak at night as part of their reproductive ritual. Light pollution disrupts this ritual because the frogs do not know when it's time to croak. Frogs and toads have been known to cease their mating activities altogether in areas where light pollution occurs. Fireflies depend on the darkness to send their bioluminescent signals using their signals for mating and to warn of predators. Stray light interrupts their ability to communicate and reduces population by disrupting their mating. Some birds migrate at night and use moonlight and starlight to guide them. The light from urban centers can cause them to stray off course and wander into cities, sometimes confusing them so much that they fly into buildings and die. It has been estimated that as many as one billion birds die annually from collisions with buildings, many of which occur from illuminated buildings at night. In addition, artificial light can disrupt their cycles and cause them to migrate too early or too late. When baby uh, sea turtles hatch, they look for moonlight to guide them to the sea. Artificial light, uh, bright lights from nearby developments can confuse them causing many to crawl in the wrong direction away from the water. Many have been killed by passing cars and are subject to predation by other animals and birds. Nocturnal moths play an important role in the pollination of certain crops and plant species. So declining moth populations have a significant effect on plant populations and productivity, especially night blooming plants. Moths are, of course, attracted to light and will often be killed when they come into contact with a hot component. The light also makes them more likely to become a nighttime meal for bats, birds, and, and other predators. Artificial light can affect when trees and plants blossom, exposing them to risk of late frosts. So as we all know, everything is connected, and when light pollution impacts one species, this affects other species that depend on it for survival. We have not yet developed the sensitivity um, uh, to the impact of light pollution in these environments where it doesn't belong, like we have with other environmental impactors such as water runoff or noxious gases. Stray light from poorly aimed fixtures or overlighting is a form of, light pollu of pollution that should not get a free pass. For uh, turning to the sky glow and loss of our cultural heritage, uh, probably for the last 200,000 years since man walked upright, the sky was a source of inspiration and wonder, and it humbled us. The stars, planets, and moon were interwoven into our everyday lives, affecting decisions on hunting, planting, traveling, and navigating, and countless other human endeavors. We are imbued with an innate wonder of what's out there and our place in it. It has inspired poets, artists, and scientists for millennia. It provides us a context for our existence in ways few other experiences can. When we lose this opportunity, we lose an essential, an essential component of our humanness. Today, it is estimated um, that 80% of the world's population lives under sky glow. In the United States and Europe, that number is closer to 99%. Beyond that, it's estimated that two-thirds of our fellow Americans cannot see the Milky Way from where they live, living as they do under the equivalent brightness of a full moon or worse, caused by light pollution. Indeed, when an earthquake blacked out Los Angeles in 1994, the police received many calls from worried residents about the bright bands crossing the sky, which was, of course, people seeing the Milky Way for the first time. 
That city of Los Angeles now casts a glow that can be seen 200 miles away. Without light pollution, about 2,500 stars should be visible at night. Most people now perhaps see a few hundred at best. In cities, it might be a dozen or so bright stars and a planet or two. From 2012 to 2016, the amount of artificially lighted area grew 2.2% each year according to satellite data. That's more than 11% growth in just five years. As this current slide illustrates, we are experiencing the creep of light pollution in mid-coast Maine, but fortunately there are still dark areas to preserve. And as you can see, I'm trying to map out where we are, and um, obviously the blackest of space further north is where there is no effect of light pollution. <coughs> but here in Brunswick, we can see Brunswick Bath and uh, Lewis and Auburn over here, Augusta, Waterville, Bangor. Rangeley is still somewhat pristine, um, but obviously dark gray and red are the most intense areas of light pollution, and we're, we have some of that here in the, in the middle of town, but um, it obviously fades off quickly as you get out of town, but this is an advancing scourge on our landscape here in Maine. Astronomical research has also been impaired by sky glow. It has become so pervasive that many fam famous observatories near cities, such as the David Dunlap Observatory outside of Toronto, the Yerkes Observatory outside of Chicago, have unfortunately transformed themselves into historical sites and education centers. Even the historic and revered Mount Palomar Observatory in Southern California, uh, home to the 200-inch Hale Telescope, is being assaulted by sky glow from San Diego and Escondido. Even night vision training of our soldiers is being affected by sky glow and light pollution near military bases, such that several Texas counties, where a lot of these bases are located, have had to enact certain light pollution controls if they are nearby bases. So I have a question. How many of you remember uh, the first time you were under really dark skies. What was it like? Was it magical, wondrous, even scary? Um, once when visiting the Hayden Planetarium in New York, I got to meet a man responsible for developing their cutting edge planetarium programs, programs that are then uh, distributed throughout the country to be shown in other planetariums. And I asked him how he became inspired to, to the point of dedicating his adult life to the pursuit of educating others about astronomy and the night sky. He told me that it was the result of visiting his grandparents' farm outside of Waterville, Maine, if you ever heard of that place, um, when he was 10 years old where he saw a truly dark sky for the very first time. It was awesome. I was hooked, he said. How many more such opportunities will there be to inspire other young scientists and educators when we can no longer see the night sky? There is a growing body of scientific research and literature regarding the beneficial aspects of awe. In an April 2017 article in Psychology Today, called The Emerging Science of Awe and Its Benefits, the authors stated, recent studies exploring this complex emotion have discovered compelling connections between the experience of awe and enhanced critical and creative thinking, improved health, a sense of embeddedness into collective folds, and an increase in pro-social behaviors such as kindness, self-sacrifice, cooperation, and resource sharing. Awe is one of the few emotions that can reconfigure our sense of time and immerse us in the present moment. Now to be sure, uh, a dark sky is but one place in our world to experience awe. But given the significance awe can have in how we perceive, our, perceive ourselves and interact with others, is it really something that we should allow to slip away from us? We need more 
not less awe in our lives. And as Albert Einstein once said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. <clears throat> Turning to the human health effects, which are becoming better understood, stray light shining into one's bedroom can disrupt the body's circadian rhythm, the body's internal clock. Our body produces certain beneficial chemicals as we sleep, such as melatonin. Melatonin has antioxidant properties. It induces sleep, boosts the immune system, lowers cholesterol, helps with the functioning of the thyroid and other, other glands and organs. Nighttime exposure to artificial light suppresses melatonin production, which is obviously not good for human health. Recent research in the Journal of Neuroscience and the Journal of the National Cancer Institute on studies involving shift workers, such as nurses, have reported increased incidences of cancer, including breast cancer, among patients with the brightest bedrooms, caused by having to sleep during the day. There is a growing body of scientific evidence, such as the 2016 American Medical Association's report of the Council on Science and Public Health of a study called the Environmental Effects of LED Community Lighting that document similar health consequences. To emphasize how much this topic is in the news, it's worth noting that Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbach, and William Young, and Michael Young, excuse me, three American doctors, won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Medicine for their study of circadian rhythms. On a more readily observable basis, <clears throat> the uh, poorly designed and aimed lights or of the wrong color temperature can, and, uh, can produce glare that can be hazardous to us as pedestrians and motorists. Um, who in this room has not had to squint, sometimes frantically and with a prayer, uh, in the face of blue headlights coming at you. Um, that is glare, and if it gets bad enough, it's considered to be disability glare. When the introduction of stray light into the eye reduces our ability to resolve spatial detail. This is worse, um, particularly for, uh, of, uh, to older people, because of changes to the eye caused by aging. And because Maine has the oldest population of any state in the country, these considerations should be of increasing importance as we design our roadways and sidewalks and attempt to control the type and placement of lights. And finally, from a human health perspective and global warming, every photon um, that we waste had to be generated somewhere. While we move to more renewable sources of electricity, and that, which is welcomed and a necessary change, the fact remains that in the United States, 64% of our electricity is generated in a power plant that burns some form of fossil fuel. Therefore, when we unthinkingly waste light, we necessarily increase the amount of CO2 and NO2 emitted into the atmosphere, which contribute to global warming. We also release particulate matter, which exacerbates asthma and other respiratory diseases, and SO2 that acidifies our lakes, rivers, and the ocean. In the face of these realities, it's really nonsensical to be carelessly wasting electricity through bad lighting. Turning to the effects on us as taxpayers, uh, excessive public lighting, especially street lighting, wastes taxpayer money. According to the International Dark Sky Association, the residential and commercial sectors used about 232 billion kilowatt hours of electricity for lighting, including street lighting, uh, which is about 6% of total U.S. energy consumption. 
IDA estimates that about 30% of outdoor lighting is wasted due to poorly aimed fixtures, over lighting, and lighting areas when not needed. This electricity use costs about $3.3 billion and its production releases about 21 million tons of CO2 annually. It would require the planting of 875 million trees every year just to consume what is contributed by wasted lighting. Bringing this to the state level, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, Maine consumed about 11.2 million megawatts of electricity in 2017. If we follow those national averages of 6% being assigned to lighting and 30% of that is wasted, then about 202 million kilowatt hours of electricity are wasted in Maine every year. At an average price of about 13 cents a kilowatt hour, that costs us over $26 million. At the local level in Brunswick, they, we have about 1,100 street lights, costing the town about $220,000 a year to operate. Taxpayers should be just as concerned with excess inefficient street lighting as they would be if a fire hydrant was left open and running all the time or if the town office had no doors on it and heat was escaping all winter long. Yet, we don't seem to look at lighting in the same way. We need to examine our current thinking and practices with regard to lighting and consider how we can become better stewards and redeploy those tax dollars spent on wasteful lighting to other public purposes. So what's being done? Um, fortunately, for the last 31 years, an, or an organization in Tucson, Arizona, the International Dark Sky Association, has led um, the fight to educate about light pollution and to do something about it. Formed in 19 uh, 1988, it is now the preeminent organization worldwide in efforts to control light pollution by identifying and publicizing its negative effects on human health, animal habitats, and global warming. Its mission is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. It works with the public, city planners, legislators, lighting manufacturers, parks and other protected areas to implement smart lighting choices. Through its outreach and public education, they have informed audiences all over the world. It has chapters throughout the United States and on five continents. IDA certifies dark sky places, and as of August 2019, there are more than 120 of those places um, around the world, uh, across six continents, in fact, comprising about 35,000 square miles. The nearest one to us, by the way, is the International Dark Sky Reserve at Mount Megantic, Quebec, just over the border uh, from uh, Coburn Gore, where the terrible train accident occurred a couple years ago. Um, IDA's fixture seal of approval has been applied to thousands of products manufactured by more than 100 lighting companies. And they have worked with the Illuminating Engineers uh, Society of North America to develop a model lighting ordinance that can be used by local planners to make their lighting night sky friendly. In 2010, they published a white paper, Visibility, Environmental and Astronomical Issues Associated with Blue Rich outdoor lighting that set the stage for much of this current discussion about lighting. 18 states have enacted some form of light pollution legislation, most of which relates to lighting on public properties and roadways, requiring full cutoff fixtures. <clears throat> Maine is one of those states, adding a requirement that the installation or replacement of any outdoor lighting fixture over 1,800 lumens, which is about 100 watts, at properties for which state, state funds are used must use a full cutoff design for their fixture. That's a helpful start, but a long way from what's needed to curb this growing blight. Mexico just enacted new national legislation to control or declare light of a form of pollution if it is misused. 
and this has um, started the discussion in that country about lighting standards on streets, towns, and at historical antiquities. Um, excuse me. So, the challenge of LEDs. Um, you've all heard the term. Light emitting diodes are solid state lamps with semiconductors compared to tradi traditional light bulbs that use some form of filament wire that emits light when a current is passed through it and it heats up. Developed as far back as the 1950s, it wasn't until uh, the early 2000s that manufacturing techniques allowed much greater use of these lamps when white light could produ be produced very economically. LEDs are extremely low maintenance, having lifespans of 100,000 hours or more. That's 20 years plus. Um, they are dimmable. Uh, they use far less electricity than the incandescent bulbs or mercury vapor or higher low pressure sodium lamps that they replace. Having no hazardous chemicals in their design, what's not to like? Um, the problem that soon emerged with LEDs related to the amount of blue emitted in their spectrum. Measured in degrees Kelvin, just as stars are, the higher in degrees Kelvin an emitting source is, the bluer is its light, referred to as its correlated color temperature. Um, Daylight, for example, has a uh, correlated color temperature of 6,500 degrees Kelvin. It is naturally very high in the blue spectrum. Blue light scatters easily in our atmosphere. It is not absorbed the way other colors in the spectrum are, which is why the sky is blue. The problem that has now been recognized is that the heavy blue component in 5,000 degree Kelvin lamps causes more glare more scattering into surrounding environments, more sky glow, and more potential to have effects on human health. And as you can see, the um, spectroscopic analysis that um, at 5,000 K, there's a very high blue spike, essentially it's same at 4,000 K, uh, and 3,000 K is, the, is what is being recommended uh, in the town of Brunswick and in many other places that are considering this issue. At that level, you have a good um, rendition of color, and as you can see, the the higher uh, CCT of this uh, this color temperature does have uh, a less effective uh, color rendering ability uh, of, of being able to see the true colors. Um, so um, the uh, it is estimated by the yes, there is something called this, the New World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness, um, that if all the low-pressure sodium lamps in Europe were converted to new LEDs to save energy at this 4,000 K level, that the level of light pollution would increase by two and a half times in Europe because of the scattering effect of the blue. But it's not widely appreciated until local ordinances are updated to address this issue, we face the prospect of a huge number of these blue-rich LEDs being installed in new developments, in retrofits of existing exterior commercial lighting for shopping areas and street lighting. Because LEDs are so efficient and so maintenance-free, the installations being made today will not need to be serviced for an entire generation for another 20 years or more. So now is the time to address these issues. Fortunately, there is a movement in Maine that is recognizing the importance of uh, correlated color temperature of replacement lamps. Interestingly, it's being driven by a number of forward-looking towns and cities that have exercised their recently granted right to buy their streetlights from their local utility and take over operation and maintenance. As reported in the Press Herald on July 29th, more than 50 main towns and cities have bought out or are considering buying out this, their streetlight contracts with CMP or Emera. Portland recently bought out its 6,000 uh, unit lighting infrastructure from CMP and converted them all to new, smart LED 
uh, lighting at 3,000 degrees K. Between the purchase price and the three to four million in upgrade costs to swap out all the fixtures, um, the city estimates its electricity bill for lighting will reduce from $1.2 million a year to $125,000 a year, mm -hmm. which makes payback enormously quick given that kind of uh, public investment. Um, because, and these are examples of over lighting by the way, uh, because these lights are smart, they are dimmable, uh, and the city dims them later at night, saving electricity and undue brightness in their neighborhoods. Reportedly, they can even tint them in blue or red to let people know of parking bans and snow emergencies. Um, Portland's updated ordinance has also capped all new LED installations at commercial locations to a color temperature limit of 3,000 degrees. Mount Desert near Acadia National Park recently set their limit at 2,700. At the local level here in Brunswick, the planning board is in the midst of major review of how, ordinance, uh, of how the ordinance deals with lighting. Um, there seems to be a consensus forming that a 3,000 K ceiling should be established for new developments. In fact, although we have not had the authority to impose that, it has been stressed to all applicants that have come before the planning board in the last two years that they should limit their uh, lighting to that level and all have um, agreed to do so, which is much appreciated. Um, but the trickier part uh, will be dealing with the topic of grandfathering and how alterations and maintenance of existing lighting will be dealt with. Should there be a sunset provision um, that uh, on existing uses that say in 10 years uh, all such outdoor lighting has to conform to the new standard? Or should the ordinance uh, require conformity only if, say, a certain percentage of the existing fixtures uh, are replaced or a certain percentage of the square footage of the buildings are modified, much as happens with the American with Disabilities Act and what triggers improvements to allow accessibility? Another thorny issue will be um, the extent to which modification should apply to residential properties. Do we really want to be examining people's porch lights and dooryard lights? Can we afford the enforcement of a standard even if we chose to adopt one? Um, but it is a matter of consequence, particularly if it's your bedroom that's being lit up by your neighbor's light. Um, given these realities of having only one code enforcement officer per, in most towns, expecting them to police such a residential standard seems unrealistic. Whatever is done has to be accompanied by a public education campaign to educate our citizens of the issues and how they can choose responsible outdoor lighting. And on your table is just a single handout that suggests what those standards are. First off, um, it is light only what you need lit. Um, only when you need it, no brighter than necessary, with a lamp color of 3,000 degrees K or less, and with a, an approved IDA fully shielded downward light. Shopping locally or online, you can find IDA's fixture seal of approval. I thought I brought some here, but I don't, uh, I must have left them at home. But um, uh, uh, let's see, you can, you, you know, fixtures have uh, automatic uh, photo sensors that will cut them off, but even if your fixture doesn't have that, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's both sell outdoor lighting bulbs that have photo sensors built right into them, so they will turn off at dawn if you're inclined to leave a light on all night. It will shut itself off. Better still is to have motion sensors that um, only turn on... Um, when there is an activity that generates a need for light. Um, and again, more expensive fixtures have that, but now there are bulbs with, photo, with uh, motion sensors being built right into them, and they're, they're less than $10. Um, and you can get floodlights that have the same, uh, the same features. Um, and finally, putting that light on the ground where it's needed is an essential component to this. Uh, many ordinances have, uh, even for residential lighting, prescribed full cutoff 
uh, when the light bulb lumens exceed a certain limit. Um, what about crime? Um, because much of the public equates darkness with fear, lighting is a necessary part of public safety. For that reason, there may be pushback to suggestions that we have fewer streetlights or that we dim them uh, in the wee hours. The irony is that because of many uh, existing bad outdoor lights, such as what's pictured here, conditions for nighttime crime already exist. Um, the, uh, in this particular slide, if someone were coming into that scene, their eyes would immediately be affected by the brightness of the light and the, sh the, the shadows would become darker. In this picture, there's actually a man standing at that gate that is not readily visible because of the constriction that happens to the human eye. So besides the fact that about half of all crime occurs in daylight, uh, there has been no documented proof that making the kinds of changes that would make a community more dark sky friendly will result in an increase in crime. Portland, with its new standards, has not reported any increase in, in crime since they uh, went into effect. Um, other ways to help. You could consider becoming a citizen scientist. An international program called Globe at Night has been operating for the past decade or so, so, the purpose of which is to gather recordings from people all over the world of the limiting visual magnitude of stars that they can see from their locations. They compare what they see in the night sky with a star chart or a series of charts of differing magnitude and then report that. Their observations are loaded into a database and then compiled into a light pollution map from the ground up. And these maps are used to help calibrate um, light pollution maps um, produced by satellite imagery. It takes only about 15 to 20 minutes, all of that time really, for your eyes to dark adapt. Um, you can then log on to a website and record your results. And for those of us in the room who are younger and just attached to these devices, there's a free app for your cell phone, which you just take a dark exposure, cover the lens, take an exposure, and then point it up at the sky, take another picture. It produces a result, and you can upload it right from your phone into the Globe at Night database. Um, you can also review your local ordinances and what they say about lighting. I can guarantee that you won't find much. Um, towns that have experienced more recent developments, such as Freeport and Topsom, have more detailed lighting provisions affecting the developed areas. For example, Topsom's ordinance for the Topsom Fair Mall requires parking lots to dim within a certain time of store closings. Um, Freeport has more detailed lights for its village district, for example. When S SMA reviewed the r more rural communities, such as Cumberland, we found that in a comprehensive document of more than 32,000 words, lighting or light appeared only seven times. Mm -hmm. um, Brunswick's new ordinance, adopted in 2017, has but one page of 276 pages uh, that deals with lighting. So very few of these ordinances address the, the color temperature issue of 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And uh, as I've previously stated, we need to take that action now. And finally, contact your legislator to let them know of your concerns and to encourage responsible state standards for outdoor properties, such as public parks and roadways. Um, uh, we have written, our SMA has written, the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry that controls state parks, suggesting that Maine designate one or more state parks to dar as dark sky parks um, as part of the state's ecotourism strategy. But it will take many voices in this chorus before we'll make change. But there are literally, as that light pollution map showed you uh, early on of the Brunswick area, there are literally millions of people on our doorsteps who can't see the night sky from where they live. So why not promote this as another reason to visit Maine and celebrate our ruralness instead of bemoaning it? Um, so in conclusion, I would say that uh, darkness is a very valuable resource 
But as these slides illustrate, there are many ways in which this resource can be squandered. Overlighting with different kinds of lights. Um, lighting at times when it's not needed. We had this little quiz of what's wrong with this picture. It's five in the morning. It's winter time. The restaurant's closed, uh, but there's all these lights being left on. Um, like trespass, light from a big, you know, uh, burner on the side of a barn or something, you know, spilling off into the neighbor's property. Um, in a subdivision, too bright street lighting along streets, lighting, you know, where people need, you know, blackout curtains essentially to keep light out of their bedrooms. Um, overlit canopies for gas stations and other types of uh, fast food operations. Um, so it's, it's out there and it's affecting our ecosystems in all kinds of ways and uh, now is really the time to do something about that. It affects the quality of our life, the opportunity to experience the majestic, denying us, denying the human soul the opportunity to recalibrate. Um, and light pollution can affect our ways that are just beginning to be understood and it definitely affects our pocketbooks and municipal budgets. But if we're smart, we can control it. It doesn't have to be glaring, as this slide illustrates. This is, you know, proper scale and illuminance and color temperature and parking lots in Arizona. Um, and here's a neighborhood lighting scheme that throws light where it's needed but doesn't destroy the night sky. I hope you have a better understanding of what our, the cumulative impact of our individual choices and you know what you can do and that you can help make our communities and state the way life should be, a place where you can see the stars. Uh, thank you very much. I, I wanted to have a, a, just a little demonstration uh, about a couple things. And um, if we could dim the lights um, over there. Now this is pretty basic, uh, I will say, but it was shown at the, uh, by myself in another, um, even dimmer, can we take them pretty much most of the way down? Yeah, and I think those little buttons turn off. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know if this will work without it I'm totally dark, but we'll give it a try. Ah, all right. Um, You know, there aren't very many of these, but an unshielded street light is, um, you know, glaring light out in all directions. We still see these. We see them in public buildings and so forth where they're throwing light in all kinds of directions. And is it really helpful? Can you really see when you're a pedestrian uh, trying to navigate that area what's really going on? Um, you can't because it creates, the contrast creates very dark shadows that are impenetrable. If you go to the junior high school in Brunswick, they have got some perfect examples of this where they've decided to light a mile down the parking lot with a thousand watt mercury vapor lamp that if you're not going in that direction but you're actually heading towards the school, you're totally blinded. There are absolutely black shadows where you can't see what's going on in them. And, um, but when you put a cap on these kinds of lights, here's what happens. Suddenly, you can see the ground around the lamp and it uh, throws light where it's needed and nowhere else. And so it's a very simple solution. Uh, more of our ordinances and, and public places are recognizing this and doing this voluntarily, but uh, a few years ago that we're still seeing a lot of decorative lighting that was completely unaware of this kind of dynamic and um, was not using uh, proper shielding. Um, I also wanted to um, illustrate the difference between 3,000 and 5,000. And uh, I got to see if this is, which one this is. Turn both audio through. Right. Yeah, that's true. I was just trying to announce it. All right, I'll let you figure it out. Uh, one of these is 2,700 degrees Kelvin, and the other is 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So here we go. Yeah, this is the uh, 2700, and you can see it's a much more, it's a warmer white, uh, you know, kind of like the soft white that you would put inside your house. 
Um, this is throwing about 800 lumens. This is slightly brighter. There's 840 lumens, but you can see just just looking at these two, how much brighter, uh, seemingly brighter or glaring that light is. And that's really what we're talking about between the difference of three and five out on parking lots and uh, on public roadways. Um, and one other thing I wanted to um, bring to your attention that isn't so much um, an issue of light pollution as much as sky pollution <laughs> is um, the recent development of uh, launching huge numbers of new satellites. And I don't know if any of you have followed this in the press, but uh, there are plans uh, afoot by Amazon, by um, SpaceX, um, uh, uh, Elon Musk, and others to put up as many as 40 or 50,000 satellites uh, that will provide internet coverage pretty much all over the world. Um, but they're launching these in huge batches of 60 to 120 at a time. They're launching every two weeks. And it's been done without any real consideration of the impact on both visual and radio astronomy. Um, so there's a lot of consternation in the astronomical community about the impact of this. Especially, you know, there's if you go and just Google, you know, satellite launches, you you could pick it up, but there was recently a story in, in Vox magazine yesterday about this very topic uh, and about scientists down at Ceratololo uh, in uh, Chile, which is one of the high mountain observatories, um, and just having streams of these satellites pass right through their images. Um, a single satellite or an airplane can be subtracted relatively easily, but with whole trains of these things going through, um, it, it, uh, it really can destroy astronomical research and uh, radio astronomy research as well because of the uh, electromagnetic radiation here, I guess, that we're, you were talking about earlier. So there have also been plans I've read about in a Chinese city to put up an artificial moon uh, to light city streets at night, just use reflected light. Uh, the Japanese are launching um, uh, uh, objects that will simulate colorful meteor showers. Uh, so that's, that's happening. There's talk about uh, some of these satellites being put up into space that configure themselves into advertising. Um, so it's another classic example of the tragedy of the commons uh, because there's no real regulation of low Earth orbit space, uh, that these, these things are possible. Now, there are benefits that come from it. You know, increased internet can get it to places even like Maine, where, you know, broadband and access has been a big issue. Uh, certainly can reach other parts of the world, but it comes at a cost, and it should be done after careful deliberation with interested stakeholders, and it's not happened that way so far. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. You've been very patient, and nobody, I don't think anyone really fell asleep or anything. So I appreciate your, your attention tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes? Uh, I'm very, I wish I had known um, some of this fascinating news that uh, I've absorbed tonight. I'm especially interested in two issues. First, you mentioned that many towns have a, reached an agreement with CMP and have purchased the fixtures themselves, and then the towns themselves will be responsible. I'm curious whether that's, for a small town, whether that's an expensive, that first step is an expensive <coughs> step. I'm also interested in whether there's been any uh, blowback on liability municipal liability policies and because I run into the argument I hate bright lights. I absolutely hate them. And I run into the argument that you have to have a certain number of lights and they have to be bright because if somebody falls down and breaks an ankle, you're in big trouble if you're a municipality or even if you're a homeowner. 
So those are my first two questions. Okay, well, uh, as to whether it's affordable by town, um, I know that, um, you know, I know that Falmouth has done it, um, you know, not a big city, but, you know, obviously that is a, a well-off community. Um, I think the cost to buy out the equipment at, in Portland was, you know, half a million dollars. It wasn't a surprising amount of money. You've got to think about it. It's been fully depreciated probably by the utility. So on its books, it's not, it's not carried at much. Um, you know, the cost was converting all that to, um, you know, replace all the fixtures to put that in. Um, but then the savings are significant. The, the unfortunate irony of this is that the more towns that do this, the sooner CMP, CMP which will have lost an annuity, yeah. will be back before the PUC saying we've got to raise the rates on everything else because we need to deliver 8% to our shareholders. So, you know, that'll be, that'll be an issue that we'll face down the road. The other issue that uh, is out there for municipalities is the fact that um, reducing the amount of electricity used is not rewarded currently because there are the tariff structure the Public Utilities Commission for streetlights is fixed base it's it's priced on the number of fixtures and it's not based on actual usage so there's a charge that is, applies to the town so when the if the town takes over they're going to pay the same tariff to the utility for the uh, electricity but they won't get the benefits of reduced usage until we change the tariff structure for municipal street lighting. Um, liability issues, uh, I know I was at the town of Yarmouth town council meeting a couple month and a half ago where the town wanted and voted at a public vote to change their street lights, um, but there was concern on the council about liability of the poles and what they were inheriting and whether things were properly separated from cable and so on and so forth. So they were kind of hung up on that issue about the potential liability of just owning the infrastructure that they're working through at the moment. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, you have to light at a certain level. Not all streets are lit. Not all areas of town are lit. So I'm not sure that that is, that may be an answer that people give, but I don't know that it's uh, the correct answer. Um, because otherwise we would have liability all over every town because wherever there wasn't any street light, someone is going to sue the town or sue somebody for falling down. So um, I think that's a convenient response, but um, other, other, yes? Oh, oh, thank, by the way, great presentation. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, one thing I was thinking about was how these ideas spread. And do you ha have any idea whether people who are trained in architecture and city planning are, are, be are beginning to get this message? Oh, I think they are. I mean, based on, at the planning board, based on um, the people that come before us on presentations, um, you know, typically their proposals include all kinds of cut sheets of, the, of lighting and, and also a lot of photometric analysis of how that lighting will fall as to property lines and so forth. Um, so they're getting it. They may need a nudge because they may not be, I don't think they're all fully sensitive to the, the blue issue. Um, in fact, a lot of manufacturers trying to figure out what to choose manufactured a lot of 4,000K bulbs and uh, have been trying to push those out mm -hmm. because they've got an oversupply of them. So it's a little bit going against the tide to, to, to damp that down to a lower color temperature. But um, it certainly can be done. Uh, I think an interesting example, if you, if, if you have ever been over to Whittier Field that Bowdoin operates its football field, that was just lighted for the first time um, within the last year. And there was a lot of discussion about how to install those lights. And the people on Bowker Street, which is right along the edge of the field, were concerned. And the results are pretty impressive with how one thing, another thing about LEDs is that they can be aimed very precisely because the individual bulbs can be targeted to a certain direction. So at the edge of that field, there is very little light spillover uh, onto the street. So I think, you know, the, the lighting community and the architects are getting the message, but the final message about the color temperature, I think, still has to be advocated for. 
until it's in an ordinance. Um, any other questions? Well, um, thank you very much.